Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. Three crime scenes, a search for at least two suspects, and one police officer shot. That manhunt underway right now after the shooting of a Balcones Heights police officer shot this afternoon near Interstate 10 and Loop 410. Several law enforcement agencies responding to that call. It was in the 6900 block of I-10 West around 2 o'clock this afternoon. That's just inside the I-10 Loop 410 interchange here. Balcones Heights PD, San Antonio Police, the Bear County Sheriff's Office, and state troopers all there to secure that scene and search for that shooter. And it's a search that is ongoing. Devin Clark has been out there most of the afternoon. He has the latest on the officer and the search for that suspect. Two officers very much in danger today, Devin. That is correct, Steve and Myra. As the sun is going down, these details are beginning to come to light. We have now confirmed that two Balcone Heights officers were responding to reports of burglary of a vehicle and suspicious persons here at the Seoul apartment complex. And Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar now leading the investigation says that when officers got here, they approached suspects inside of a vehicle. And one of the suspects did something to make officers feel threatened. And at least one of those officers drew a weapon. And then an exchange of gunfire followed. At that time, Sergeant Joey Sepulveda, an 18 year veteran of the Balcony Heights Police Department, was shot in the shoulder and neck area. And that second officer, Edgar Ortiz, who is fairly new to the apartment, but has five years of EMS experience, returned fire and was able to drag Sergeant Sepulveda to their vehicle and rush him to the hospital where at last check he was in critical condition, undergoing surgery, but expected to pull through. Officials, including the Balcony Heights mayor, crediting Officer Ortiz's quick action for possibly saving Sergeant Sepulveda's life. Now, this chaotic scene that unfolded here before 2 o'clock this afternoon, of course, drawing the attention of neighbors in the area, including Lydia Pacheco, who says she's lived here for 30 years and never saw anything like this before. Estoy con nervios porque... I'm nervous because I saw a lot of action here so close to my house. All of the police were rolling by here, by my house, and by I-10. And while several people have been detained for questioning, there are currently no suspects in custody. However, take a good look at your screen because investigators believe this man, last seen in a Ginobili Spurs jersey, is one of two, possibly three, suspects involved in this shooting. We know that at least one of the suspects may also be injured and possibly seeking medical help. Investigators did find a white truck that they believe was used in this crime, but they're asking for anyone who knows where the suspects are to contact them at 335 6000. And again, we do know that the suspects are out there. So we want to emphasize that police believe that they may be armed and dangerous. So if you do see them, do not approach them. Instead, as we said before, please call investigators. The, get, the number again, 210-335-6000. For now, reporting live in Balcony Sites, Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. And of course, we'll follow the very latest on that investigation and the search. Thank you, Devin. With major events being canceled or postponed because of the coronavirus, some participating in the San Antonio Livestock Show are concerned. For months, students have spent countless hours taking care of their animals, hoping to compete at the Livestock Show. The rodeo is still scheduled to start next week, despite a letter from County Judge Nelson Wolf asking them to postpone. Our Tiffany Huertas has a look at how delaying or canceling the event could affect local students participating. I show pigs in the purebred breeding show and the crossbred breeding show at San Antonio. Jaredenton High School senior Claire Vivlechka has been participating in the San Antonio Livestock Show for several years. I spend up to two hours every single day out there feeding my pigs, walking my pigs, cleaning their pens. She is looking forward to this year's event. I have the opportunity to participate in events where I could win scholarships. We're going to hope that it doesn't get canceled and we're going to push forward as if it's happening just like it went in a normal year. Students at Medicine High School have also been preparing for the Livestock Show for months. If the event is postponed, or canceled, there could be a financial loss for the students. The average price of just the lamb itself um, is about $1,100. Uh, that does not include entry fees, feed, uh, they have to rent the facilities here on campus, uh, supplements. About 120 Madison High School students will be participating in this year's livestock show. So the goal is that these students can get to San Antonio, get a spot in the sale, and recoup some, if not all, of that money that they put into that project. 
Postponing the event will also not be beneficial for students. For senior Shepard Smith, this will be his fourth year showing and raising lambs. With these two lambs, I actually started in July and every day, twice a day, I've been in the barn feeding and working with these lambs. Uh, countless hours before and after school. This is our last chance to prove ourselves. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. New at 6, the pandemic is creating safety concerns at the Bear County Courthouse over courtroom staffing, especially involving clerks who were often being reassigned within the system. Paul Venema with a look at those concerns and how they're being addressed. Did you understand you have a right to jury trial? Judge Stephanie Boyd is concerned over the recent transfer of one of two clerks assigned to her court. With COVID, of course, everyone uh, is fearful of a lot of cross movement. She says her concerns go beyond her staff and others like lawyers and the public doing business in her court. I have family members who, whose immune system is compromised and I'm trying to do all I can to do my part. 186, this is the clerks, whose job she said is essential to a smooth running courtroom, work for Bear County District Clerk Mary Angie Garcia. Safety for our clerks and for our public is the first concern. She explained moving clerks from a courtroom and assigning them to another often cannot be avoided. We have currently right now seven clerks, our employees that are out with the COVID quarantine. So we have to shuffle. She said it also requires finding replacements for clerks who are absent due to COVID-19. With the COVID-19, we're, we're struggling and we're working outside of the box and we're training new clerks. Garcia said that her staff is strictly following courthouse distancing and masking protocol. We're going to come through this and we'll, we'll be better for it. And... Um, that's all I can say. Paul Benema, KSAT 12 News. A growing homeless camp in downtown San Antonio has been cleared out and cleaned up following a string of violent crimes and various health hazards there. The decision to shut down that camp of nearly 50 tents at I-37 in Brooklyn came after an evaluation by SAPD a week ago. Police tell us they've had to respond to several shootings and a stabbing in that area recently, including an incident where a person was set on fire. Various health concerns also playing a role here, including the discovery of feces around the camp. Several local nonprofit groups were on hand today to help those living in homelessness in that area. As a service provider to the clients that are staying there, we worked really hard to help communicate with them about what was going to happen, provide duffel bags to pack up things, and we're trying to make this transition as peaceful and kind as possible. Those who were living in the camp have been encouraged to seek shelter and assistance at Haven for Hope and Sam Ministries. Time saver traffic right now. Let's go to the Trans Guide camera. This is I-10 and Callahan. There's an accident in the eastbound lanes and it has actually shut down the ramp, the flyover from I-10 to 410. You can see it's completely closed down. A major accident here. I-10 and 410. This is the Callahan camera looking eastbound. This is something you need to know about because you're not going to be able to get on 410 if you're coming from I-10. And ironically, this is all not all that far from the shooting scene where the Balcones Heights officer was injured about 2 o'clock, 1.30 this afternoon. Today in a San Antonio City Council session, a proposed change to the city charter that would allow more flexibility in how the city uses its bond dollars. But some council members are worried about how exactly how much flexibility that change would actually provide. The current city charter only allows bond dollars to be used for, quote, public works. City staff want to broaden the wording in a way that would make affordable housing or economic development projects also eligible. But several council members say they want that proposed language tightened up, concerned over how the new flexibility could potentially be abused. District 9 City Councilman John Courage was one of two council members to refer to it as opening Pandora's box. I know this council is committed to affordable housing, but I don't know what another council would be committed to, or I don't know what might come out of uh, the Economic Development Department or what might come out of the Public Works Department or what might come out of private enterprise coming to the city and saying uh, we need certain things. 
The council is expected to vote next week whether to put the proposed charter change on the May ballot. City staff say voters would have to approve it during that election in order to affect what could be included in the next five-year bond program. And turning to weather right now, more than 70 degrees today. Ooh. And a nice sunset to boot. Another good one. That's right, another beautiful sunset with those high clouds streaming overhead. So have your cameras ready here for about the next uh, 40 minutes or so. We should have some pretty good color out there. Look at the Almanac data today, exactly average this morning with the low of 42. Then we topped out at 76 for the high temperature. So well above average, but record breaking territory is mid 80s this time of year. Tomorrow will be, I think, 80 degrees just about across the board in South Texas. Right now you look at the reading, 75 Helotus, 74 New Braunfels, Comfort currently at 71 degrees. And we do get a little closer to 80 right along the border. Catula at 80 degrees, Del Rio now at 78, and Laredo checking in at 80. As we go through the evening, temperatures really not falling off a whole lot. For the most part, we'll spend our evening and night in the 60s. And then tomorrow morning, I do think we'll wake up to some areas of fog, which could affect the morning commute. More on that, visibilities, and a temperature swing coming right up. Antonio Metro Health, and this is our COVID-19 update for the community. Tonight, we're reporting 1,012 new cases of COVID-19, which brings the overall case total to 177,802. Our new seven-day rolling average is down slight to, slightly excuse me, to 1,463. Sadly, we are also reporting 14 new deaths tonight, which brings the total lives lost to 2,181. Please keep their families and friends in your prayers. Um, many of us know uh, just recently we've lost uh, members of the city family, including uh, a San Antonio police officer. So please do keep uh, them in your prayers tonight. Over in our hospitals, there are 1,127 patients being treated for COVID-19 in local hospitals. That's down 49 from yesterday, so we have resumed our downward trend, we hope. There were 121 new admissions in the last 24 hours, 394 in intensive care this evening, and 236 on ventilators tonight. Let me turn it over now to Judge Wolf. Well, th thanks, Ron. And it's... Uh Good to see a, another drop in our hospitalization tonight after two days of going up a little bit. Um, but you know, we, we, we sat here and we talk about the numbers and I think it's important, you've mentioned it before, that every number we mention is a person that's either got terribly sick from COVID or ended up in the hospital or passed away and uh, uh, it's just uh, tragic, tragic what, what we're seeing. Uh, you know, I had a, there's a poll I was looking at today by the Kaiser Foundation. Uh, they polled uh, on January uh, of this year, U.S. adults. And um, while we're pushing for the vaccine, want more vaccines, uh, unfortunately, that poll showed only 47% of the population would get them as soon as they could. 31% were unsure. They wanted to wait and see. But the most depressing number is about 20% uh, will not get it. They, uh, they said 13 said definitely not get it. The other 7% said they wouldn't get it unless they're forced to. Of course, we are not forcing them to. So you got 20% of the population that you know is not going to take it. 31% not sure. And to reach that, what we call herd uh, immunity, uh, I think you have to be at around 70%. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's going to make it harder getting there with so many people that just don't won't, 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 won't take it. But we need to keep, continue to work forward. Uh, they had an incident at Dodger Stadium where they're doing mass vaccination, and people are still out there caught carrying signs saying COVID scam. It's just hard to believe uh, that that happens. Um, we, we, we're still doing about 3,000 again today of those for the second shots out at Walgreens. We're still doing shots down at, uh, at the uh, uh, Brady Green hospitals, a total about 3,500 a day. So things are moving along there. We keep hearing about more vaccines coming to our community. And um, George Hernandez was on a call today, President University Hospital, and 
Uh, it looks like those are going to be going, whatever that might be, the increase, a good part of it, I guess, will be going to the uh, drug stores and to grocery stores, which, which is good, which is good as long as we don't get cut back on uh, vaccines in our, in our site. So uh, hopefully more vaccines coming this way. We will keep pushing for that. Thank you very much, Judge. I also want to let you know uh, that the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center, something we've been talking about quite a bit over the last several months, has distributed more than 1,081 units of blood to local hospitals on Monday and Tuesday. Uh, that is more than double the supply used in the same period last year. The demand, therefore, uh, for blood donors is extremely urgent right now. Our region needs 500 donations a day just to meet patient needs. So blood shortages have been a continuing issue throughout this COVID-19 pandemic. The mayor there talking again about the need for blood, something that has been a challenge throughout this pandemic for our community. And in terms of the numbers today, some encouraging highlights there. 1,012 cases reported. That is a drop from yesterday and also a drop in the hospitalization numbers. 1,127 people hospitalized. That's down 49 from yesterday. The mayor said that they think this is the beginning of a trend that they hopefully will see continue as those numbers begin to roll back uh, somewhat steadily over the last couple of days in the hospitals. Interesting what the county judge said there. Uh, we are not seeing people right now not wanting to take the vaccine because there's such a demand for it, but he is concerned that when all is said and done, there may be a huge portion of our community that doesn't want to get the vaccine. And He's hoping that won't be the case, but it is a concern right now. All right, let's switch over to weather wise and you know, 70, 74 today. I mean, this does not feel like January. It's not bad. Even in South Texas. Exactly. We, we've had a string of pretty comfortable conditions today. It's February. That's why it doesn't feel like yeah. January. <laughs> I want to correct you in front of everybody. No, there, I'm glad Steve. you did. I corrected myself. <laughs> exactly. And so uh, well above average for this time of year, but not quite record breaking ter territory. The average highs in the mid 60s and another cold front will reset us back to where we should be this time of year. Take a look at the reading outside right now with our beautiful sunset. 73 degrees dew point of 51. That number is on the rise, a south wind at about 10 miles per hour. And it's the south southeasterly breeze that's going to continue to increase the humidity tonight. Those dew points rising, and I think the dew point and the air temperature are going to meet, and that's going to lead to a saturated air mass right overhead areas of fog likely tomorrow morning. So those dew points will be rising. And here's our future cast in terms of visibility. As early as midnight, I think we'll see some areas of fog, and then it's going to thicken up as we go through the night and early morning hours. So for the morning commute, do anticipate some areas of fog. Some of it could even be dense. That's more of a wait and see factor, but the potential is there for some dense fog with visibilities under a half a mile in parts of our area. So we could have some issues for the morning commute as a result of the fog, but by the noon hour we should clear out and we'll be off to a lot of sunshine. Temperatures are going to be all over the place right now. It's comfortable outside. Tomorrow will be up to 80 degrees after a morning low in the upper 50s. So 50s in the morning near 80 in the afternoon, a spring like day, even a hint of mugginess in the air. Then by Friday, we're back to where we should be as that cold front drops us back into the mid 60s. So a foggy morning will lead to a sunny afternoon and then into the weekend comfortable near 70. There is the potential of a few sprinkles Monday and Tuesday, but that's really it for any rainfall. 80 degrees. Whew. That wasn't cold. That was, that was, that was wondering. Good. That was a good thing. That's what I thought. Was a, yeah. Yeah. a warm yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wasn't exactly. a burr. It was a woo. All right. National Signing Day, and uh, it's a big day for a lot of high school kids. Yeah, and their parents, and, and uh, we love parents. it here at KSAT 12 yeah. Sports. I mean, because we basically just get to highlight one local student athlete after another today. We've got some high school football, soccer, and volleyball signees. Plus, the Spurs are down another player with a hip injury. We got it coming up. We started Highland Heartland High School for National Signing Day, which is always a special moment for any high school student athlete and their family. They had several students sign, including quarterback Cannon Williams, who will attend Incarnate Word. Wide receiver Dre Spriggs will go to UTSA. Dean Lineman Jaden Jackson committed to West Texas A&M. And in girls soccer, Victoria Esquivel signed with Bethel College in Kansas. It's just been a dream of mine to play Division I college football, so you know. 
Um, it's National Signing Day, you know, it's obviously a big day uh, for everybody over here. So, you know, I'm just really excited to, um, you know, start this next chapter of my life. I picked that school because it just felt like home when we visited. Um, the team was like, the team was really cool. We all got along really well and it was just seemed like the right fit. The love, it was really the love from the city, the coaches, everybody on the coaching staff, uh, my, my whole family, they just, it just seemed like the best decision to make. Out of Johnson High School, the Jaguars have 13 student athletes put pen to paper, including quarterback Ty Reasoner in Air Force Academy commit. Wide receiver Shane Johnson will go to Sam Houston State. In boys soccer, Samuel Moore committed to Chester University in Chester, England. And Arden Cantwell committed to play volleyball at Our Lady of the Lake University following her sister Daisy, a freshman outside hitter. Daisy would come home almost every day and just tell me how much she loves it. And that definitely pushed me over the edge of saying that I just definitely want to go to Our Lady Lake because I want to be coached by one of the greatest and be able to play with my sister. My grandfather served in the Air Force and he's always been a role model to me. And um, knowing that, you know, I could follow in his footsteps and go into the Air Force Academy uh, is honestly a dream of mine. Uh, it was great just to see everybody sign, everybody put in the hard work, everybody's able to be here and sign with their brothers. That's what it's all about. Once his senior year is over, Joshua Green will leave Brandeis High School for Tarleton State University in Stephenville, Texas. He says this is a dream come true, and it also sounds like a family tradition. My family is pretty much full of athletes. My brothers all played sports. My dad played collegiate sports, and, uh, you know, they're real proud of me. Uh, going to college, you know, getting it paid for, like, you know, you can't really beat that. So, you know, it's, it's, it's good vibes all around the house. Sam Houston High School defensive end Darius Govan will continue his education and play football for Blinn Junior College. Govan is 6'5", 200 pounds, a first team unanimous selection at DN. Today was a proud one for the Canes and his family. It's very important to my family because I'm the first boy in my family to make it to college. So, you know, that is a big step. Check out this tweet by Jefferson Girls basketball team, your 2020-21 District 27-5A champions. They beat Sam Houston last night 43-40 to win their first district title in program history. Congratulations to Coach Benavides, her staff, and all the players. And Lytlehead Girls basketball coach and athletic director Lori Wilson tweeted they're officially District 27-3A champions. Lytle won a Poteet last night 68-17. They wrap up the crown. They're 19-5 overall, 12-0 in district with one game to go before playoffs. And in the NBA, the Spurs will wrap up their five-game homestand tonight against the Timberwolves. Big man LaMarcus Aldridge is out, right hip flexor soreness, and small forward Rudy Gay is out with left hip flexor soreness. Tip is 7.30 tonight at the AT&T Center. And Greg will have those highlights for you on the night beat. All right, one of those kids is going to play soccer in England. Yes. How cool is that? That's very cool. <laughs> very cool. It's our own Ted Lasso. Thanks, Mary. Uh, you're welcome. Our case at Q&A is up next. The department he leads, the San Antonio Fire Department, very much on the front lines of this pandemic. We're joined now by Chief Charles Hood from the San Antonio Fire Department. Thanks so much for being with us. We have a lot of important topics that we want to talk to you about today, and we appreciate your time. Let's start with the pandemic. So many times we think of healthcare workers, people who are working in the hospitals as the frontline workers. Your department is right up there. You're also now administering the vaccine to homebound seniors. Talk to us just about the fire department's response and, and how you're playing this critical role. Well, first of all, it's, uh, it's great to see both of you uh, virtually, unfortunately, but the San Antonio Fire Department has been the tip of the spear for COVID response, partnering with Metro Health uh, for over a year now. We started our 323rd day of operations, which sounds crazy, but we've been doing this for almost a year um, exactly. So uh, if you look at everything that we've done from testing, uh, you know, we're managing 16 testing locations to uh, building isolation care facilities to um, all the different things that we've had to do to make sure that our folks are protected. Last month, we had approximately 81 of our members that had COVID. Today, we have nine. So protecting our folks has also been a challenge for us. But right now, we're doing something that's really, really cool. And I've had a chance to go down every single day when 
we've been at the dome except for the weekends and uh, we're doing mass vaccinations. So to see uh, someone pull up, uh, they have maybe a special needs child or they're elderly uh, and they tell you that this is a new lease on life for them, that they haven't been out of the house for six months uh, now that they, they, can, they can go see their grandchildren, things like that, they really make you feel good. So we've saved so many lives by giving the vaccine. Something that we've started this week is really important because we have a lot of our seniors that can't get out of the house. They can't go stand in line to get a vaccination. They can't even get in a car and they're homebound. So up to date, since Monday, we've done 610 uh, home vaccinations to where our paramedics are going out to selected homes, either because they are Meals for Wheels, uh, they're Saha residents, or they're a population that we respond on them quite frequently. So we're going out and addressing them. And so by the end of the week, we would have a thousand of those folks done. And so I caution you because I think everybody's seen here over the last couple of days, do not call 911, do not call 311 because we are not just responding to anyone to be vaccinated. But again, we're saving a lot of lives. We're very, very excited about that. Yeah, you're going to old school. You're doing literally doing house calls with the people of San Antonio who can't get out to get this vaccine. I think that's great. Chief, I want to talk to you about the fact you're in a documentary that's coming up uh, on KLRN next week. I believe it's on the 9th. Uh, it's called Living in My Skin. You've done it. You did a PSA with uh, your sons after uh, the riots that broke out after the peaceful Black Lives Matter protest. Do you, with it being Black History Month and you being one of the most visible black men in San Antonio, do you feel an obligation to speak out on some of these things? Um, yes, we were kind of chatting before we started. Uh, I've always had this platform being the fire chief of the city of San Antonio and in leadership roles in Phoenix, but never felt the need, the, the urge, the uh, complete obligation to utilize this platform and, and talk about what it's like being a, a, a black man. I am blessed to have four sons. And so my, my kids, my two youngest, were here with me when George Floyd was murdered. They saw civil unrest uh, firsthand. And so they wanted to march. They wanted to be a part of that. Um, the unfortunate part of it is that I, I saw my parents protest. Um, I was a young man. I was, you know, probably four years old when uh, JFK got killed. I was, you know, barely in school when MLK got killed and, and, and Bobby Kennedy. So I grew up seeing um, civil unrest, the riots uh, in, in cities all across this nation. And it was very sad for me to have to have my sons witness this firsthand and see it, but they wanted to be a part of it. And so I'm obligated. Um, I, I sat down with my command staff and I told them to just close their eyes for a minute and, 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 and think about some of the things that I have to deal with every single day or an African-American man. And I told them I have to pray differently for my kids because when my boys walk out of the house, they have to know, okay, if you get pulled over, these are the things that you have to do. And I witnessed that firsthand in Los Angeles when my uncle got pulled over. So some things have never changed. It's unfortunate. Um, so I do have to use this platform. And if I don't, if I remain silent, I'm not, I'm not being successful as a leader or, or the man that I need to be uh, and an example for my children. I love that you mentioned that you witnessed your parents' protest. You witnessed parts of the civil rights movement because as we are in Black History Month, I think it's important for all of us to realize that we're witnessing a moment in black history with the Black Lives Matter protests we have seen over the last year. We don't have a crystal ball. We don't know how the history books will remember this time, but how do you hope history will write the story of this movement over the last year? Well, you know, this is historic times and, and it's an honor that we have Black History Month, but, but black history has been from the start of this country when we came over on slave ships and we were the economic engine for this nation. And, um, we still deal with some of the same challenges and it is my hope that um, we've been joined by such diverse uh, diverse communities and people throughout this nation that have taken up this fight 
uh, that they they understand that what has happened to 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 blacks in this nation, a lot of those things they're they're terribly wrong. And hopefully we can write some of those things through this time. But but history right now, it, it's it's writing itself every single day. And it's how we respond as people to adversity. And, and I, I'm proud to say that African Americans have, have proudly responded to adversity throughout the years. But again, we we need to continue that. Things have not changed for the better for all people. So for me to be able to talk about the dynamics or the things that happened to me, everyone on that um, documentary, they're all successful, they're all professional, they're all educated. Um, they all experience the same forms of racism and it, it's just unfortunate. And, and so my goal is that uh, when my kids are my age, when they're, when they're 60 years old, that, that they're not dealing with the same challenges that my dad did and my grandfather did. So, um, yeah, I love being the fire chief of the city of San Antonio. It's it, It's been the highlight of my professional career. But when I leave this job, I'm still going to be black. And so I have to take this opportunity to speak up whenever I have an opportunity to. I was struck by what you said in the Living in My Skin episode that airs next week, but also what you said in that PSA, because you were very clear about your sons and about the dangers that they face, but you were also very clear in the fact you do not condone the violence and some of the things that we've seen or that we saw in downtown San Antonio. So I was struck by the fact that this is, it's complex. I mean, this is an issue that, you know, you can't put somebody in a certain category and say, well, this must be how they feel. I mean, there are different, there are complexities to all of us. And so I, I really appreciated the, the complexities that you brought out in that, in that PSA. I also, I also want to mention, because we're out of time, but I do want to give a shout out to the SanAntonioReport.org because they did a story on you spending two weeks uh, aiding in the Columbia, the space shuttle Columbia debris. Uh, and so I, I, it's a fascinating story. And so uh, I wanted to talk to you about it. We're, we're out of time, but uh, I appreciate always the time that you give us, Chief. Thank you. Well, great to you know see what? you. It it, it's great to see both of you guys. I miss you. Virtual hugs. Yeah, there and, you uh, go. We'll talk to you soon. Take care of yourself. All right. Take you care. You as well. We'll be right back. The Golden Girls of the Golden Globes, Amy Poehler and Tina Fey, they are back to host this year's award show, but doing it from different coasts. Fay will be live from New York City, while Polar will be in Beverly Hills, California. It's the comedian's fourth time hosting the award show together. The 78th annual Golden Globe set for February 28th, delayed nearly two months because of the pandemic. Look outside with live cam this evening. I feel like this is the portion of the show where I just say, ooh, these last couple <laughs> days, because the sunsets have been so beautiful. You said, whoa, now you're saying, ooh. I'm, I mean, you know, I'm full of sound effects. You're very expressive <laughs> at six. I have one request. Next time, just give me a whoa, whoa, whoa. There we go. Even better. <laughs> yeah, sunset 614 p.m. So we still get that good color at this time of day. And it's nice to have that during our six o'clock newscast. Today, we started at 42, made it up to 76. That's in San Antonio. We did hit 83 in Catula, 80 in Del Rio, Pleasanton and Beeville hit 80. 80s will be more prevalent tomorrow. We're going to talk about that than our next cold front coming up. We're in a very spring-like stretch of winter here in we South are. Texas. Spring-like stretch in February is what we're seeing now. And there is a potential for some much colder air coming down the pike. We're going to talk about that. It's part of it's one of the topics that's on the docket here this evening. Spring-like tomorrow again, but even warmer than today. A comfortable weekend, and we could have some issues for the morning commute. So we're going to talk about that first, and that really correlates to the moisture content of our air. It's not humid outside. You don't notice the mugginess, but take a look at the dew points right up into the lower 50s along I-35 and these numbers will continue to climb through the night. So increasing moisture content as our temperature drops and I think the air temperature and the dew point will meet and that's going to give us some saturated air and even lead to some areas of fog to start the day tomorrow. So the issues we could have for the morning commute 
I do think will be some areas of fog, potentially even dense uh, for a period of time, meaning visibility down to a half a mile or less at times through the morning commute. Then that fog should slowly burn off. We'll get rid of the low clouds and have nothing but sunshine by the noon hour lasting through the afternoon tomorrow. So a little hiccup in the day will be some morning fog. Otherwise, very spring like. Beautiful sunset this evening. Gorgeous. Love to see that this time of year. Still those high clouds coming off the Pacific, providing us with such beautiful color and a nice, nice picturesque sunset. 42 this morning. That was exactly average. 76 the high temperature, 11 degrees above average. We're going to be even warmer tomorrow, but we have to talk about our overall weather pattern. That Arctic air that's going to be moving into the lower 48 and how it could impact us. Still warm here right now. 80 Catula. 73 Hondo in San Antonio and into the 60s in the hill country. The wider view, it shows some colder air out there, but it's not real Arctic air. It's just polar air to be technical. It's just cooler at and slightly below freezing. But you get up into Canada, that's where we have the Arctic air. Temperatures below zero there, and that colder air is going to be pushing southward and really spreading itself across the northern tier of the US. So tomorrow, 80 degrees here. Then a cold front hits tomorrow night, but it's just going to reset us back to average for this time of year. So comfortable conditions still tomorrow all the way through the weekend. That Arctic air, it looks like it's going to remain bottled up across the northern tier of the US all the way through the first part of next week, say Monday, Tuesday time frame. But there is the potential that by about next Thursday, next Wednesday, Thursday, middle of next week, it could dislodge and start coming southward down the plains and we could get a little taste of it. But really for the foreseeable future through the weekend, early next week, we could be talking minus 30 there, North Dakota, Northern Minnesota. Meanwhile, 60s near 70 here in San Antonio. So that the core of that cold air is going to stay off to the north of us. Tomorrow, 57, an unseasonably warm start to the day with that fog and then sunny into the afternoon right near 80. 80 San Antonio, I do think we'll get well into the 80s, especially south and west of town. Uvalde about 84, Del Rio mid 80s. Laredo could be flirting with 90 degrees tomorrow afternoon. Catula about 86 along with Carrizo Springs. And where the fog takes a little longer to burn off in the morning, may just be in the upper 70s and that would be some locations just east of I-35. But by and large, very spring like tomorrow and well above average. I don't think it's going to be record breaking, though. We'd have to hit 85 to tie the record in San Antonio. That cold front hits tomorrow evening with it. You'll notice some wind tomorrow night and then back down to average in the mid 60s Friday near 70 through the weekend. A good amount of sunshine and then into next week. There is that potential for some more noticeably cold air coming in by about this time next week with potentially highs in the 50s. All right. Thank you, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. Good morning to you. It is Wednesday. Fired a vacant apartment on the city's north side late last night. Firefighters say it appears that homeless people got into the vacant apartment and started the fire. They estimate damage to be worth about ten dollars to $15,000. No injuries were reported. Top stories we're following today. Castle Hills police say they had to use a stun gun on a driver who led them on a high speed chase early this morning. Police say they believe that at the time he may have been intoxicated. That's when they tried to pull him over. Instead, the man kept driving and officers say the chase reached speeds of up to 80 and 90 miles per hour in neighborhoods. Officers say the driver finally stopped when he hit a parked car at the Harris Suites apartments. That's when police say the man got, got out and tried to run. Officers say they had to use a stun gun to stop him. He was then arrested on several charges. Yet another Fiesta event canceled due to coronavirus safety concerns. The Battle of Flowers Association announcing earlier today that it has decided to cancel its annual marching band competition, the Battle of Flowers Band Festival. Three crime scenes, a search for at least two suspects and one police officer shot. That manhunt underway right now after the shooting of a Balcones Heights police officer shot the 
this afternoon near Interstate 10 and Loop 410. Several law enforcement agencies responding to that call that was in the 6900 block of I-10 West around 2 o'clock this afternoon. That's just inside the I-10 Loop 410 interchange here. Balcones Heights PD, San Antonio Police, the Bear County Sheriff's Office and state troopers all there to secure that scene and search for that shooter. The stock app Robinhood is well aware that it now has a PR problem, which is why the company is paying big bucks for a Super Bowl ad. It will air a spot featuring everyday people to drive home the message that Robinhood is, quote, opening America's financial system to everyone. Democratizing investing has long been a key selling point for the app. But that identity took a big hit when Robinhood stopped trading stocks like GameStop, AMC, and other favorites of small investors organized on a Reddit board when the equi equities were skyrocketing in value. Robinhood shut it down. That resulted in a class action lawsuit against the company and condemnation from lawmakers, including Senator Elizabeth Warren. Robinhood reportedly paid five and a half million dollars for a 30 second spot. Tomorrow morning, some fog, otherwise sunny and spring like right near 80, then back closer to average Friday through the weekend. The potential for a bigger cool down by about this time next week, but a lot of uncertainty around that. So the weekend comfortable. We'll keep you updated on next week. All right. Thanks, Adam. And thanks for watching the news at six. See you on the night beat at 10.